Hello, dear listeners. It's Bunga Cast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. It's Thursday, the 30th of June. My name is still Alex Hochuli, as is Philip Cunliffe in the case of Philip Cunliffe and George Hoare in the case of George Hoare. Yeah, I mean, that's factually true. We live in such a world of flux, of such short termism. You can never even know if the categories attached to things still apply or indeed if, if your names are still your names. So appropriately, we're talking about uh, this sort of short termism about a world of not just finance as a discrete section of the economy, but financialization, a world which is financialized and which the ways that finance behaves have seep their way into society, into non-economic activities. Anyway, so we're talking today about uh, speculation, and we have a guest on, Aris, and his surname I uh, don't want to have to pronounce twice, so I'm going to say it uh, in the interview, which you're about to hear now. But he has a new book out called Speculative Communities, Living with Uncertainty in a Financialized World. So as usual, uh, you're going to hear the interview, and then we'll be back for an after party at the end. Catch you in a little bit. All right. So I'm very happy to be joined here today by Aris Komporozos Atanasio, um, which might be a speculative pronunciation on my part. Um, I don't know if I got that even in the near ballpark, but uh, how are you? Impressively spot on. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe the speculative stuff does uh, have something going for it, um, which is, you know, what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're here to discuss your book, Speculative Communities, Living with Uncertainty in a Financialized World. Um, and when, uh, you know, w- when I saw this book, I think the title in- in- immediately intrigued me because it sets up a question uh, to which we don't have an answer yet, very obviously, that this this idea of both real and imagined uncertainty dominates our world. And I feel like part of and one element of this story is the sort of increasing short termism in politics and economy and society that speculation seems to be a part of. Um, rather than seeking to plan the future, we seem to react. Um, and that goes both for political elites and, uh, you know, alternative movements who might be seeking to challenge that. Uh, So, I mean, it does strike me that we seem unable to make long lasting commitments, uh, whether it's, you know, state managers committing to a national project or radicals committing to parties or to long term revolutionary horizons. Um, And your book uh, is really interesting. It's challenging because it seems to suggest that there is no retreat, that the way out is through, um, that we have to somehow embrace this world of uncertainty. We're going to get to all of this in a second, but I did want to start actually with maybe might be the more tangible or um, immediately conjurable images, uh, at least for listeners who won't be familiar with the book, which is the world of dating, romance, love, sex, and so on. Uh, you dedicated the middle chapter of the book to this, to, to speculative intimacies, as you call it. And I wanted to ask you about this because one thing that stood out for me immediately was your um, challenge to Eva Luz's work. Now, regular listeners of this podcast might be familiar with it. We've discussed it in our reading club and made reference to it elsewhere. But um, just for listeners' sake, uh, her work on cold intimacies, broadly speaking, discusses how the rationalization of a dating market through apps uh, has not created an increasingly alienated world. And you argue against this approach, um, which which maybe surprised me, but I'm I'm really intrigued me at the same time. So you you say that mobile dating apps do not merely satisfy the value maximizing urges of a romantic entrepreneur, as someone might act on on Tinder, uh, but nor do they represent an absolute lack of commitment. Um, That in fact, these scrolls and swipes that we do on Tinder or Grindr or whatever, um, are how we survive the wounds opened by the rite of passage into speculative communities. So anyway, I found that all very intriguing. So maybe just get us started, if you could explain out what you mean, what your uh, contention is against Eluz's approach, um, and how you see this, you know, new world of dating and dating apps, maybe not being the hellscape that people understand it as. (laughs) Yeah, well, thanks very much, Alex, for this uh, great introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here on the podcast. I'm a big fan, so um, I'm excited to be discussing these themes with you. And yeah, the the world of dating apps, like you uh, mentioned, is, I think, a fascinating one. And one that really captures the broader atmosphere of uh, our time, I think, uh, in the sense of this prevailing sense of uncertainty, volatility, and the ways, the kind of tentative and uncertain ways in which we um, navigate this environment in our everyday lives. So this, uh, uh, we'll have the chance to talk a little bit more about the way in which uh, 
the, the kind of responses uh, uh, in, or in our everyday life that I touch on in the book beyond intimate life. But intimate life is usually uh, an arena whereby cri critical theorists tend to turn to with very um, uh, with a lot of with a great deal of skepticism and, and pessimism. I mm. would say um, it's something that you know our uh, our encounters with um, with dating apps, our use this kind of uh, mono monomaniac uh, kind of doom scrolling approach. To, to intimacy is inevitably evokes a very uh, grim kind of image. And I, I don't necessarily fully disagree with that. I'm not uh, suggesting in the book that uh, the, the dating app industry is providing some beautiful, wonderful answers to our uh, pursuits for, uh, for uh, intimacy and for um and for, for sex and for uh, romance. But however, what I what did struck me as interesting about the use of dating apps um, was that they they seem to not only provide outlets for these kind of uh, doom scrolling, but to also provide connections. Now, the kind of connections that Tinder or Bumble or Hinge offer can be uh, very ephemeral can be very short-lived, uh, unsatisfying, unyielding. So, uh, but nonetheless, they are connections. There is, in other words, in other words, a, an attempt in, uh, th there is something in the ritual of swiping that does perform a, a social um, role. That there, there is something that happens when we scroll uh, beyond the match itself, which can be uh, disappointing and, 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 and problematic in many other ways, of course, because these markets are heavily, of course, uh, uh, misogynistic. There's a lot of uh, racism uh, and uh, uh, all sorts of sinister phenomena. Nonetheless, the, to go back to this question of what kind of, how can we understand that ritual of swiping uh, in, its, in its fullness? Does it tell us something more beyond a uh, kind of this nihilistic uh, approach to, to, to intimacy. And, and in the book, I claim that, that it does. I claim that uh, it is part of what I refer to as speculative communities. It is part of the infrastructure of these speculative communities um, in the sense that um, there is, uh, the, there is uh, the, the figure, the figure of the entrepreneur that Eva Luce mentions in her work uh, is captures only one side of that, uh, of that um, agent, of that subject uh, that uses the dating app. So the side of uh, indeed uh, mechanistically uh, going through choices, through binary choices of left or right swipe uh, in the hope of uh, some yield, some, something, um, some benefit in the future. Uh, so there is, although that is true, that there is, of course, these apps are financialized, that they adhere to this binary left or right swipe. Um, again, I don't think that that is the whole reason, that, that that captures the whole reason why we find ourselves immersed in, this, in these apps. And so um, that, to me, reflects, there is something about the Im Im more imaginative world that we uh, sort of create and partake in uh, through our swiping, uh, the, mere, um, the mere act of, uh, of doing the swiping is uh, we, we knowingly, I mean, we do so, I say in the book, in the knowledge that uh, thousands, millions of others are swiping uh, simultaneously. Um, and so there is a sense of, uh, of uh, a collective, a sense of sociality that is different. It looks different to a a, a real uh, community uh, as it's uh, as could be traditionally defined. But it is nonetheless a kind of imagined community. And so, in the book, mm. I set out to explore uh, how these kind of communities come about and what other other manifestations across our social and political life. That's all uh, very interesting. I, I even wanted to bring something up from that chapter about, uh, well, I guess what you could call techno mysticism, but I want to double back to that in a bit. I'm just going to trail that because I found it a, a 
very, very uh, surprising discovery. I wasn't aware of these uh, like astrology dating apps and there's something interesting going on there, but let, let's return to that um, because it would be good maybe to, to actually kind of return to the beginning um, and build up uh, your case um, based on, I guess, the two main concepts, one speculation and the other being community. So let's start with speculation. Um, could you explain what that is? I mean, people would understand that, I guess, as you know, gambling effectively. But how, so you differentiate that right at the beginning uh, from investment. So what's the difference between speculation and investment? And how do each of these relate to uncertainty and risk, respectively? Because those are two terms that are often bundled in together, but you make an important distinction between them. So speculation is a term with a long history, both within the discipline of economics, but also in uh, the social sciences, in philosophy, in the arts. So there is something quite fascinating about the concept, uh, which has to do with the multiple meanings that it encompasses. Uh, what particularly interests me in the book is a, a uh, is two key readings of speculation uh, that have to do with openness on the one hand and closure on the other. Now, this is something that is very important, and it often uh, we uh, we often understand speculation as uh, as you mentioned as gambling as a, a kind of approach uh, as as a as an almost irrational uh, approach to uh, to the future to uncertainty uh, as a kind of the taking of risk that exposes us to the forces to the powers of. Uh, of, uh, of life. Um, but there is something about speculation that also encompasses closure. What do I mean by that? In, in economics, speculation entails the, uh, the taking of, uh, the, the, the taking of uh, risk uh, with the purpose of profit. And um, it, uh, a speculative activity tends to be considered as a very risky activity. Uh, so uh, there is something about uh, a relation towards uncertainty that speculation expresses that is an openness to that uncertainty, a willingness mm. to, in, to engage in an upfront way. But at the same time, speculation also um, entails an element of closure. And by that, I mean, uh, the in the financial sense of the term, um, speculation uh, fulfills a, a, a function of insurance. So uh, in markets, a speculator is a figure uh, whose risk taking uh, is uh, re re moves risk around in the market in so that uh, other agents in the market uh, can be uh, so th they can be secure. So there is uh, there, so there is that element of um, of insurance that is a very important, uh, it coexists. So there is always an openness towards the future, but there's always uh, uh, an, this element of insuring the market, of, of, making, uh, of making sure that a market doesn't overheat, that it remains liquid and stable. Uh, and, and so uh, there is a moral side there that speculation uh, also um, uh, uh, and has mm. that um, because of that function, because of that- sort of unintended uh, consequence, right? Exactly, an unintended consequence, we can say. Um, and, and, and so that then brings me to, uh, to the point of um, the controversy around speculation, because uh, this distinction between what constitutes investment, that is a more productive way of, of investing capital in an economy, um, uh, and what is speculation? That is the more uh, uh, the more kind of risky type of behavior uh, uh, towards um, uh, towards uncertainty, the taking on of greater risk in in financial markets. Uh, the, it, this has been a debate that has been with us for over 150 years at least, and this is a history that I try to to unpick in the book. Um, so, from the inception of the at least from the inception of the formalized. Uh, speculative markets of futures and derivative products in uh, the Chicago Board of Trade in the late 19th century, there was a, a, a debate, there was a very intense debate around what, uh, what was the role, the social role uh, of the speculator in uh, the Chicago Board of Trade. So where they, the, uh, the, the kind of betting that was going on on future contracts 
far removed from the realities of farmers and um, and the agrarian populations around the city. Uh, there was no real product that was exchanging hands, not even contracts were exchanging hands, but speculators were making uh, a great, uh, great profits. So uh, was that a moral activity? Was that a kind of morally legitimate activity? And, and the answer given historically, both in the 19th century, uh, as well as to our day is that to a certain degree, yes, speculation is a moral activity because for the reasons I mentioned earlier, because it does fulfill a, a role uh, of uh, balancing, securing, ensuring mm. uh, the market. Um, uh, at, at the same time, though, the one thing I want to say is that the uh, painting speculation with the brush of gambling was something that the institutional defenders of speculation, so the, the courts back in the 19th century, century, the Illinois court that regulated in favor of speculations in, in some important cases, um, but also the, uh, the, def the defenders, the broader the, the defenders of speculation in the, in the history of uh, financial markets have always uh, attempted to, ha have always suggested that speculation that takes place outside of the formal institutions of the exchanges constitutes gambling. Right. So, uh, it's the little, it's so something that, the little guys do, you know, the, exactly. the kind of big players invest or, you know, take the, you know, engage in the stock market, the little guys gamble frivolously or something or riskily. Precisely, precisely. And not only the little guys, it, it tended to be, uh, as I, uh, as I uh, sort of uh, look at the book and as, as some uh, other important historians have mentioned, um, it was also women, it was people of color, uh, it was uh, farmers, it was the sort of excluded uh, uh, groups uh, in society who uh, had access to what we what was then called bucket shops, so this kind of uh, grim, uh, dim, dense of, uh, of speculative activity that were just mirroring transactions of the uh, formal exchanges and gave the, were giving the opportunity to a vast array of uh, um, uh, informal retail traders to, to bet. So, um, so yeah, there's a long history, and, and I think there's a long history of that, and it's a history that is important uh, also for understanding more contemporary developments around the uh, debates on speculation um, and the political uh, the political side of speculation that I touch on in the book. So mm -hmm. the, in other words, the way in which uh, ordinary people uh, relate to risk and uncertainty and, and the way in which we often uh, denigrate their responses to uncertainty as irrational or as uh, mere gambling. Uh, interesting, because I mean, obviously, the financialization of the economy has been very widely discussed. But uh, you claim that it's obviously not just an economic phenomenon, but has become, and I'm going to quote, uh, the very practice around which modern societies coalesce, the vernacular through which we express our collective disbelief in the waning legitimacy of neoliberalism, which is um, quite a claim. I mean, certainly the, the latter part of that um, is something which is quite arresting um, that it, in fact speculation rather than being an emergence from you know the financialized economy uh, itself a product of neoliberalism the inability to find productive investment and so on um, as well as all the forms of neoliberal subjectivity in which we become entrepreneurs of the self etc 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 but in fact that somehow speculation is a vernacular through which we express our disbelief in in neoliberalism so that's quite interesting could you explain what what you mean by that yeah sure so this is something that um i was i wanted to um so this comes from my uh curiosity around the the post 2008 financial crisis way in which uh, uh, societies around uh, around the globe uh, seem to be responding to uh, a set of uh, political developments. So the turn, uh, mainly I'm speaking here about the, the rise of ethno-nationalist populism across the globe in the manifestations that we know in, in the US with Trump and uh, in the UK with the uh, Brexit vote, but of, of course also um, uh, beyond the global north, uh, you know, the, the, the politics of Modi, in India, um, uh, Putinism in Russia, uh, the situation in Brazil. Of course, there are uh, huge differences across these contexts. But I think that one interesting way in which one can approach 
the uh, the rise of the uh, uh, neo uh, populist kind of right-wing narratives during the 2010s following the financial crisis is uh, through the lens of political speculation uh, as a currency, in other words, speculation as a currency in politics uh, that resonates with uh, big swathes of society um, that becomes a more um, uh, that becomes a, a response uh, that offers a, a, a more accurate um, representation of the, uh, the the state of play in, in mainstream politics. So what, what I mean by that is that in, in the post-2008 uh, 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 moment, we are uh, at a point where uh, the global legitimacy of uh, neoliberal centrism as it kind of, uh, uh, as it um, as it exists in in the in, in those years, it seems to be waning. That there is this kind of growing sense of uh, disbelief in the promise of this entrepreneurial investment, this kind of individual uh, uh, risk taking entrepreneurial self that uh, uh, wh whose austerity in the present is bound to offer some returns in the future. That's that's a logic. Uh, and a relationship with the future that I think is changing quite dramatically in the post-2008 years. Uh, and, and so um, this rise of the, the variations of neopopulist uh, narrative uh, captures a much more uh, kind of chaotic and a much more um, sort of uncertain way of relating to the future and uh, linking the present and the future, essentially. So uh, uh, what I was saying earlier is that speculation uh, becomes in this context a, a more uh, natural response, a more appealing, if you like, response to uh, the inability to uh, control the future, to uh, the disbelief in the return on your present investment. Uh, and so uh, by speculation there, by, by this kind of political speculation that I describe in the book uh, is manifested in uh, political behaviors that seem to endorse quite perhaps counterintuitively to endorse narratives that are, are very chaotic, that do mm. not offer stability, seemingly at least, that seem to immerse us even further to uncertainty. You know, the, the narratives, the Trump narrative of trade wars and, uh, you know, of, of governing by chaos and, and uh, uh, against the kind of state bureaucracy, you know, in the early years of his presidency. Uh, and, and this jointed set of ideologies uh, that I think... Uh, uh, and con contain an openness, right? They, they don't offer, we often see this populist narrative as uh, we read it as a, a narrative of closure, of nationalism, of, of this kind of uh, sense of regressive uh, security. Um, and that is certainly part of it, but it also, uh, I argue in the book, contains an openness. And much like speculation, uh, I think it is this duality, this, this, these two sides of closure of the nationalist symbolic insurance of, uh, of populism on the one hand, but on the other hand, also the openness to a future that, that uh, is unknown um, and it, it might well be chaotic, uh, but nonetheless, it is the most, uh, the best future that we can have. And so there is kind of a cynical uh, and even in some cases, optimistic embrace of that, unknown, mm. um, which, which I found uh, very interesting. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I can kind of see that chain of logic between sort of disbelief, um, delegitimation of neoliberalism, disbelief in um, ma mainstream narratives that, for example, you know, rising tide will lift all boats and therefore uh, a willingness to speculate or even to kind of go screw it, you know, which you see in certain anti-political protests. But I want, I want to come back to that definitely and explore mm -hmm. that a little bit further. Before that, I want to come to the other major element uh, in the book, which is the question of communities. And so you, your work makes use of Benedict Anderson's famous imagined communities. Anderson in that book, for, for the sake of listeners, argued that nations were imagined communities, but not in the sense that I think has followed in some of the crudifications of his work, whereby the nation is just a, a thought object, a construction that can then subsequently be ignored, but rather it's a kind of materially rooted argument about print capitalism and specifically newspapers, which allow citizens to creatively imagine themselves as belonging to the same community of people, even though they won't know the majority of them face to face. And I think, as Anderson famously put it in, in the book, the nation in a way answers the question, why are we here now? So, you know, the kind of the who, the where and the when. 
And so you try to leverage this sort of uh, argument around imagined communities and the role of imagination and forming these communities into this new world of speculation that we inhabit now in the 2020s. So could you give us some examples of what these speculative communities are and indeed how they might seek to answer, you know, Anderson's question of why are we here now? Mm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, I think you you very, I really like the way you um, sort of summarize there Anderson's argument in the book, which is a very compelling one, I think. And uh, like you said, often there is, there's an aspect of that, there's a dimension of that argument that, that is missed in in some of the accounts of, of Anderson's work. Um, and that's precisely the uh, the materiality of the imagination, the, the way in which uh, the function of the imagination in society has a very, is materially rooted and, uh, and generative. Um, and that's something that I, I explore in the book uh, alongside uh, uh, Benedict Anderson's work with uh, the work of another very important thinker, the French Greek uh, psychoanalytic theorist and philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis, um, who uh, has provided perhaps the most sophisticated framework for understanding this generative uh, material role of the imagination in society and politics. Um, and so the the, the, the way in which uh, Anderson and Castoriadis both uh, uh, conceptualize imagination uh, in, in is, is um, by focusing on the relational aspect of it. So, the, so Anderson famously uh, speaks of the, uh, of the American who uh, wakes up in the morning and uh, reads uh, his newspaper uh, and turning the page uh, he, as he turns the page, he imagines uh, 30, 300 million fellow Americans doing mm. so, uh, and, and, and it's, in, it's that knowledge that uh, leads him to imagine himself as part of a bigger national community. And, and so that's a, an, an evocative image that I think really captures what I was trying to say in response to your first question about the, uh, the dating apps and our swiping and our doom scrolling and, and swiping right and left and that that is also a ritual that evokes a, a, a larger imagined community, perhaps quite different to the one Anderson imagines. But uh, nonetheless, there is something here, I think very important in, in the way in which uh, the materiality of those uh, print technologies for Anderson, uh, the, the, the novel, the narrative novel, the newspaper, um, but also uh, infrastructures like uh, the, the map, the visualization of the nation, the museum, the census. Uh, these are all infrastructures that are, uh, uh, it, we, with, with the rise of print capitalism, they organize our way of imagining ourselves in a broader society. And indeed, they offer uh, texture and, and depth to, to this uh, kind of uh, symbolic notion of the, of the nation. And so uh, I wanted, what I wanted to do in the book is I, I wanted to sort of um, uh, explore the relevance of these ideas for understanding the current shape of our um, capitalist, financialized capitalist communities. And so if it, if it is, because uh, although it is true that the uh, the rise of uh, financialized capital and the, uh, the 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 growth of neoliberalism in its uh, recent manifestations has had a corrosive effect uh, in in society that it has that to put it to put it bluntly that finance has fragmented and has individualized and it has uh, eroded uh, community mm. uh, I. I uh, and it has done so, and, and we can tell that story through the digital commodity that it has uh, produced, uh, uh, some of which are dating apps um, or social media, uh, that these are technologies that uh, support that individualization, that fragmentation. However, uh, that, that is, if we take Anderson seriously, um, we, uh, I think there is an, a different reading of these, of the role of these commodities uh, and of, and, and finance through these commodities in, um, in, in influencing um, our, the way in which we seek social connections and, and the way in which we establish our own imagined communities. And that is maybe a different role. There is a different, and a different kind of community as a result. But nonetheless, I, I do 
think that um, we still have a, a very, um, we, st we still are not, um, uh, we, we are, you know, we, we are not atomized in, in our, uh, in this new type of community. And, and so being speculative, um, I, I, I wanted there to, uh, uh, I, I wanted to open up our, uh, our, um, the, the definition of the modern homo economicus, the, the, that figure of uh, this rational, seen as in a binary way, as either rational or irrational um, subject, which uh, seeks to uh, maximize utility, or in its entrepreneurial version, seeks to, uh, to, to balance risks and opportunities uh, and to pursue uh, a kind of, uh, to pursue life in that, uh, mm. with, with that method. So what I wanted to suggest here is that the figure of a speculator, what I call homo speculans, uh, is a more imaginative figure. Imaginative in the sense both of how it relates to uncertainty, uh, in, that it, the, in that it sees opportunities in uncertainty, but also in the way in which it relates to others. Uh, and, that, and that is... Um, that is where the notion of speculative communities comes about. And uh, the, the claim in the book is that if for Anderson, uh, the newspaper and the novel were the uh, key technologies through which imagined communities take shape, then for our own speculative communities, uh, we turn to um, the financialized commodities, digital commodities primarily, like you know Instagram and TikTok and dating and astrology apps and you you name it uh, the kind of technologies that uh, in some ways uh, yes distracts in some ways um, emphasize our sense of despair uh, in 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 the and gloom in uh, in late capitalist worlds but in uh, in another sense also uh, create connections uh, and uh, these connections are uh, look different, like I said earlier. They might be more tentative, more ephemeral, um, but they are nonetheless connections. And and so to to give you, because you asked me for examples of speculative communities, and uh, it is a rather loose term. So I don't I don't think that we can point to a a speculative community with we can clearly delineate one, you know, with uh, that exists in a specific locale. But um, in the book, I give uh, different examples of. Uh, types of collectivities that this, that have some of the characteristics that I just described. So, uh, for example, um, the uh, uh, to take one more of the one more political one of the political uh, realms in which communities might appear. Um, I talk about the uh, the uses of uh, TikTok and especially fandom communities uh, that uh, use TikTok. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the fans of the K-pop music, the genre in, in Korea uh, that is extremely has become extremely popular uh, around the world, uh, and the way in which these uh, kind of uh, fandom communities through these social media organized very explicitly politically uh, during the wave of the Black Lives Matters uh, Black Lives Matter uh, Matter protests um, around the. Uh, uh, the, the later years of the Trump presidency and uh, acted in coordinated ways uh, to sabotage um, uh, the, uh, the right-wing conspiracies and Trump supporters uh, in the US. Uh, in, uh, and so they, they displayed some of these communities, displayed some of the characteristics that I described earlier. Uh, they, uh, they had... Uh, importantly, uh, an approach towards confusion, uncertainty, and volatility that uh, didn't seek to control it or to provide a counter narrative of stability in response, but uh, instead uh, sought so so further volatility to increase uh, confusion in the space of uh, in, in digital spaces of social media. Uh, so uh, that was an interesting political tactics of. Uh, the type of speculative politics that I describe in the book um, that makes that community speculative in that regard. Um, but, but, but also, if we take communities in the economic realm, uh, and you know, we can think of 
uh, more explicitly speculative communities uh, like the retail investments that are involved in crypto trading or the this kind of mass shorting events like uh, in the case of the GameStop saga that I'm sure your listeners will know a lot about. Mm. Um, the, in other words, uh, uh, communities of uh, uh, literal speculators uh, whose motivation for speculating uh, uh, was not solely profit, but also a sense of participating in something bigger than them uh, in, and in having an impact on something, yeah. uh, having a political impact uh, in a sense. So I don't really have very much, of course, I, I want to distinguish the two different types that I just gave examples of uh, because they have huge differences. Um, but, uh, but, but, but I'm hoping that this give you, gives your listeners the sense of the kind of community that I have in mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I find that interesting, but at the same time, and forgive me, I can't help but read that perhaps uh, as some form of nihilism, uh, not on your part necessarily, but on, on these you know speculative communities, um, or at least some indulgence in the irrational. And I mean, ju- I'm just going to seize one example from the book, which might be unfair, but I already trailed this earlier. But you know, you you dedicate a, a bit to um, astrology apps, and there's this app called CoStar. Um, you know, like the stars is in the asters, which, uh, you know, align to, you know, predict your future or whatever. Anyway, so the co-stars uh, motto says, we now need irrationality to invade our techno rationalist way of living, um, which honestly, to me, sounds like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> um, and then, and then you, um, later on, you also refer to another uh, app, which is actually a dating app, which um, combines with, you um, astrology to have people meet and it's called nuit or nui um i'm not exactly <laughs> sure um which also tries to uh you know follows astrology natal chart compatibility uh creating in some ways a double opacity um as you as you say and for me this just sounds like um the worst sort of anti-modernist retreat from the possibilities of modernity into magic and indeed you cite adorno saying that um, astrology uh, was a capitalist society's regression to magic where thought is assimilated to late capitalist forms so uh, getting to the getting around to the to my question um rather than this see, see seeming to be a way of shaping the future or in some way um taking political action by making use of this sort of speculative world and speculative of commodities, couldn't this also just be read as a sort of nihilistic retreat or a sort of nihilistic fuck it, for lack of a better way of putting it? We can't plan the future. We don't have the agency to seek to control the future. And so we are going to gamble, um, you know, imaginatively gamble our way through to, as a way of muddling through. Um, and again, I mean, I'm using the term gamble, which you said, you know, we shouldn't, we should maybe use because it's a way of disparaging, you know, the little guys or the outsiders. But um, anyway, I, I, I use it just because it's the most evocative mm. term. But uh, anyway, what's, what, what are your, what's your thought mm. on that? Yeah, yeah, it's no, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the cynicism and even in its extreme form, this kind of nihilistic uh, behavior uh, that is implicit in some of the examples I just gave is is definitely part of the story. So I I don't I don't claim that speculative communities are inherently positive and hopeful examples for progressive kind of radical uh, action and, and and kind of that, that nor that they offer uh, sort of programmatic kind of solutions out of the impasse of, uh, you know, contemporary progressive politics. So, um, and yeah, but, but, I, but I do think that there is something there that is not pure cynicism. And, and I guess what I'm interested in is um, exploring a language uh, for describing these kind of types of political agency uh, especially amongst younger generations, I have to say, and who who tend to be the users of of the kind of uh, commodity uh, digital apps that I describe in the book. Um, And these are types of political agency that uh, my view is that we cannot, that cannot be readily understood through the kind of traditional um, kind of 
political uh, critique uh, that uh, that we have in our disposal, often with, with the categories of that critique. And what I have in mind here is this um, uh, the, the this this the, the question of ephemerality, the question of uh, our relationship to the present, uh, of these these aspects of the speculative that I described, um, which do not offer clarity, but uh, but stay in the space of ambivalence, in the space of confusion, in the space of volatility. So, what does this immersion, this kind of knowingly in, in uh, uh, in inhabiting of those kind of spaces, what does it tell us, uh, if not merely a cynical uh, attitude, a cynical kind of response? And uh, uh, to give you one example of where I think there is, there are other possibilities emerging that are not not entirely cynical. Um, on from what you just said, the, day, the the astrology apps that you just mentioned, that indeed they, I mean they they look quite silly, and they are um, there is a there is a playfulness in those apps that seems to uh, you know it just kind of is, it seems to be confirming everything that Adorno has has written mm. about astrology, right? But on closer inspection, if you see how this uh, incorporated social element of those apps, uh, things become a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more interesting. So these, as I say in the book, beyond this celebration of darkness, the occult uh, nonsense and, and, and kind of this, this kind of irony and, and playfulness, there is something about the, uh, the way in which users use those apps, which is precisely to, uh, to, to connect. Uh, and to enrich their connections uh, with with that playfulness, um, and, and and so perhaps because I'm not sure how many of your listeners will uh, know of these apps or will be using them, but uh, the uh, the interesting this interesting element of of, of them is that they uh, basically uh, feed into your existing social networks on Instagram and Facebook, and and they uh, they the way they work is that the predictions and the kind of forecasts they give you uh, are personalized, but also uh, always in relation with your friends. So there's always the prompts that the app gives you are always uh, prompting you to be cynical about the future, but also to do so in the company of your friends, sort of thing. So there is something there that I find very interesting mm. in the sense of the, uh, the the relational aspect. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's an ambivalence there, I, I guess we can say at, at the very least. But I do want to turn to politics a little bit more explicitly, because there was one mm. element in the book which uh, stood out to me. I, I mean, as regular listeners will know, our contention on this podcast, and it's something that we write about in, in our book as well, is that today's populism is in some ways the shadow to neoliberal technocracy, um, and that it's effectively anti-political. It's an, an angry rejection of the establishment. Um, and you write something which seems to run contrary to that, and I was intrigued by it. So uh, I'm going to quote first uh, mm -hmm. before elaborating on it. Uh, the growing convergence between finance and populism departs measurably from the view of an anti-political populism that is generated through absence of community. So, I mean, this seems to, I mean, I guess the convergence of populism and finance is something that, you know, we've already broached in this conversation. I mean, namely this idea of in some way throwing caution to the wind or not necessarily that populism is not necessarily, as it's often understood, a reach for stability, though it might often be that or for building up walls to protect against the, the chaos of, of the world outside of, of globalized finance or whatever, um, but that it also in some ways is a, can be a leap into the unknown. Um so I, I get that convergence, um, but that but there's a second claim there that it's actually um, that it's perhaps not anti-political and that there is some community that's actually there. So could you talk us through this? Mm. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, I think this is an important point. And uh, so the, the 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 political element that I see in speculative communities, uh, I should say that it doesn't 
the, the, the starting point for this analysis isn't uh, actually the uh, right-wing populist uh, movements that uh, we have just discussed, um, though they are part of the big, uh, of the broader sort of uh, political map that I tried to draw in the book. The my the origins of my uh, political uh, critique uh, uh, in, in the book um, they are in the uh, in uh, in the in the popular in popular arguments around uh, the way in which Homo economicus and Homo politicus relates uh, under neoliberal capitalism. So the 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 very uh, perhaps some of the most important. Um, sort of strand of this argument we find in the work of uh, someone like Wendy Brown, for instance, the, the, the book uh, uh, Undoing the Demos, uh, you know, it's a key work mm. uh, in the area. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the kind of deployment of a kind of a Freudian analysis of, of uh, uh, neoliberalism and the ways in which kind of uh, uh, capitalist uh, markets uh, and financialization um, uh, st strangles kind of political subjectivity, uh, isolates, uh, atomizes, uh, and so on, um, and so depoliticizes, right? Cleaves community, it cleaves political community, uh, and 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 does the de the demos. So my again, my response, and I'm sort of being provocative there in the book, uh, but my there there is something that I also found. Uh, unsatisfying about that narrative, um, uh, in the sense that uh, the there is um, there there is uh, there is a, there is a, an outcome of uh, uh, financialization that is uh, uh, that can that should be assessed in the realm of the imagination that that that, that we should assess and evaluate uh, in terms of its influence in the way we imagine uh, and, and so this I do through speculation. This is something, uh, if speculation as a logic and as a way of imagining oneself in relation to uncertainty and in relation to others has become uh, very pervasive in our time, then there are political implications uh, in, in that subject that emerges uh, in, in that process. And there, there is a sense uh, of politics uh, there, a different kind of politics, a more, like I say, speculative kind of politics, a more perhaps swarm-like politics, a more uh, a, a more difficult one to capture, but nonetheless, I don't think that financialization and the rise of neoliberalism kind of equates to the retreat of uh, uh, political of, of the demos, the retreat of the, of Homo politicus. Uh, it, it, there is a different iteration that I think is perhaps neglected sometimes, uh, because precisely because it appears to be more speculative, more ephemeral, um, more uh, more disconnected from traditional institutions, traditional party politics, and so on. So um, to go back to your initial question, do I think that uh, the kind of Brexit, Trump kind of populism is, a, uh, is political or anti-political? Um, I, I think I, I would be, Sort of cautious to not take uh, to not take a side on this. I don't. I, I I would be reluctant to call it one or the other. Um, but I do think there are uh, uh, there are certainly uh, there are certainly elements there that should be understood politically. Uh, and I think these elements are even more apparent in uh, some of the um, in, in some of the progressive movements that I describe in the book, uh, not just the digital, the ones in the digital realm with the fandom communities and the TikTokers and so on, but also um, uh, uh, instances where um, big, uh, in, in big votes, like I say, I mentioned in the book, the Greek referendum of uh, 2015 around right. the terms of austerity um, that were going to be implemented in the country, uh, imposed rather on the country. So th there, I think we had an in interesting example of a kind of speculative community that emerges in quite a different way uh, from the Brexit type of populism, which is almost a reverse their visa position of a country uh, in, in, in the European Union. Um, we, what, we, what, what was interesting there in that kind of community is the embrace of the unknown, um, uh, that is the rejection expressed to the rejections of the, of the terms of the, um, the austerity, mm. the imposed terms of the referendum, um, a rejection that isn't um, 
necessarily nihilistic or uh, or anti-political. There is, and that uh, that is there. There was an uh, a definite community element there um, that manifested itself in different ways. Uh, and also importantly, what I want to highlight here, Alex, is that there is um, there is something about the the speculative openness. Uh, of this kind of uh, new homo politicus, the homo speculans that I described, that is what it means to stay in a space of ambivalence doesn't mean to not make any choice, but it does mean a, a kind of political flexibility that might not uh, be familiar in previous kind of political formations. Mm. And by political flexibility, I mean the... Um, siding with with forces uh, uh, perhaps opportunistically uh, that that uh, fulfill the, uh, the that are likely to um, uh, to sort of support uh, the, the the aims of of the of the group um, and to not so that what I say in the book is this is where this uh, duality of speculation the openness and closure comes alive uh, in in that there, there, there is a speculative politics that can seek forms of insurance, of collectivizing uncertainty, of sharing responsibilities and risks uh, more equally, more equitably, but at the same time uh, maintaining a degree of openness in the sense of, um, uh, of its relationship with what is uh, unknowable, what is uh, what can be quite chaotic and volatile, uh, and and in that sense also quite generative, and mm. and and so you know I think there is an interesting lesson in that kind of Greek referendum, but of course it's just one instance. But um, yeah, perhaps that gives no, but, you. An but I think I think that that is interesting. Actually, I actually want to probe a little bit further. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, both the Greek Ohi, I think, and for that matter Brexit, they are. In some ways, I mean, as I, I to use the term I already use, a leap into the unknown. Um, but you, you put it actually differently, and that's actually a little bit more poetic, which is that you know the Greek rejection of the memorandum in twenty in, in twenty fifteen was not positing a new alternative, but was uh, generative of an awareness of the crisis. And I think that's probably a, a good way to put it. Um, it's a communicable way of dwelling with the with the, the unknown, which I thought was nice. Um, I think there's that uh, there is that element to it. I think perhaps that's often forgotten that it's not just a, a retreat to safety or an attempt to forge some stability, but a, a willingness um, on the part of the large body of people to take a serious risk to jump into the uncertain or and the unknowable, uh, and to create potentially a, a new future. And that goes also in the case for Brexit, where you know in the face of so-called project fear, where a lot of mainstream institutions warned that such and such was going to happen with Brexit, people nevertheless wanted to force it through and say, no, this was our democratic vote, and um, we want to, uh, you know, whatever the potential downsides are, uh, we still prefer to be outside of the EU. Um, so I think there's something admirable there, and it's nice the way that you've captured that in terms of speculation, which is a way, I, a lens I hadn't brought to it. But um, I guess where we encounter the problem is that there's still a lack of leadership or an abnegation in some sense of agency. So yes, the Ohi, uh, you know, 61% vote no is saying, okay, we reject it. We don't, we're throwing ourselves into something potentially new, uh, effectively speculating in some way on the future, but that's still there's still an openness there, uh, a need actually for there to be leadership to spell out what the path from, for example, that no vote to uh, actual withdrawal from the EU would look like. And so I guess I, I like the lens of speculation, but don't you come back to the problem that ultimately speculation then becomes a problem, that you need uh, all the kind of planning faculty uh, and ability to not just sort of imagine a future, but really plot out and, and say, this is this is where we go uh, from here, um, that that's still absent. And actually it demands homo politicus, not just homo speculans. So homo speculans can be important there in the willingness to, to broach the unknown, but you still need uh, homo politicus to, to fill the void and, and to provide political leadership and authority. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is a very, uh, it's a very interesting one and a very important question. Um, so my take on this is that, uh, so I, I, as I mentioned already, I don't see homo speculans and homo politicus as in conflict or as uh, mutually exclusive. I, I do see 
an inherently political dimension and a generative political dimension in the homo speculants. But I do take your point. Um, so there is a kind of the, this need to carve out a space and, and a path towards um, towards uh, governance and towards kind of a practicable way of uh, of offering of addressing you know real problems and um, and and uh, and that's undeniably an important one. I guess where I'm coming from in this debate is um, a, uh, a, a I wanted to articulate a response to what at least one side of the argument is that I wanted to articulate a response to the what has been perceived as a uh, as a pressure as a as a common criticism uh, of uh, the progressive left in its um, for instance in its uh, recent manifestations it's in, in its resurgence uh, the more kind of left social democratic resurgence in uh, within uh, some of the more uh, centrist parties uh, here in the uk in the the Labour Party politics are quite interesting in that regard, the way in which uh, Corbynism kind of emerged uh, as a, from a sort of a, a completely unimportant faction into something that came close to, uh, to, uh, to being in power. Um, there was, uh, but, but there are many examples, of course, of this. I mean, Syriza in Greece is another good example, Podemos in Spain. Uh, the, these were the kind of, this kind of left populist movements which were systematically criticized on grounds of not offering a clearly enough articulated alternative. I mean, this is a very uh, well rehearsed critique uh, from the right um, that, mm. uh, that, that, that there was um, that there was, or, or, or what, that what they offered as an alternative uh, was um, uh, uh, not uh, was impossible was not workable was not uh, so there is i mean the 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 kind of systematic deconstruction and uh, criticism of the uh, of the progressive left's articulation of alternatives as a long period. Uh, but the, but it, it has also been uh, i think admittedly a uh, a sort of ill a, a an impediment for these parts themselves, for the movements themselves. Um, and I, what I was trying to do here is to suggest that especially under circumstances of such great degree of uncertainty and volatility, when the, so to speak, opponent uh, becomes particularly well-versed in navigating that chaotic space, um, uh, alarmingly so, I would say, uh, you know, with the kind of right-wing uh, nativist and populist movements that we were discussing earlier, then uh, one's answer to this uh, environment, to this shifting uncertain environment, um, or, or to, uh, must encompass some of uh, those more speculative politics mm. um, and, and must weaponize them in progressive ways. So not by giving up entirely uh, the need for a program of, of an articulated program uh, that would be put in practice to, to address systemic uh, issues, but um, by keeping, this is what I was trying to say earlier, by keeping both these elements of closure and openness uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the process of doing so. And, and, and in, in my mind, we lived through a moment, uh, we, we, I mean, we're still living through that moment, I think, whereby in this rather kind of chaotic type of politics, uh, often the articulation of, uh, uh, the, of, of clear uh, programmatic solutions can get lost in that uh, in that kind of um, uh, volatile environment, and and so uh, the the approach I'm suggesting, I suppose, it's not mutually exclusive to to that process of clear articulation, but rather enhancing it. Perhaps that it, it's where this kind of strategic openness and opportunities opportunism um, uh, can be quite uh, useful. Excellent and, and very intriguing. And I have to say, uh, the book as a whole uh, has this admirable modernist attitude, I think, of wanting to insert oneself into the storm rather than to uh, seek to avoid uncertainty's waves by <laughs> slowing down, to kind of paraphrase from the conclusion. Uh, but we'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Iris. Uh, the book for listeners, again, is Speculative Communities, uh, and it's out now from the University of Chicago Press. Thank you very much, Alex.
Hello, listeners. It's Alex again. We're back, Phil, George, and I, uh, to discuss uh, our own little speculative community here. Um, we're wagering on the end of the end of history, and there's three of us, and we imagine ourselves to be a community, even though we don't know each other's face to face, or certainly uh, hate each other's faces. So <laughs> we are a community with our listeners. Our listeners right. are our community. No, indeed, I'm, I stand corrected. And it's not a speculative community. It's a real community even if it's not exactly face to face. But then again, we meet our listeners whenever we can. So we do our best. Indeed. I think so, the podcast is like, a, is like a newspaper or novel that binds together this imagined community. So the listeners of, of BungaCast can imagine um, every other listener of BungaCast skipping <laughs> past Alex's <laughs> intro in unison to get to and the then interview. Whenever they hear a George joke, like everyone feels like you know um they want to skip over it and their eyes roll and they groan and then when they it's... hear me and alex criticize the george joke they feel this they also hate that actually no, they, they... Uh, i know <laughs> they, they also feel hate this that. warmth and protection for george and this willingness to fucking die for george in order to defend his jokes so no i think it's it's more like a newspaper you know one of the funnies in the newspaper you read doonesbury or garfield and like what the fuck this isn't funny at all who the hell but if it's exactly not there, who the hell laughs it. at doonesbury we, we need some more that's, lasagna that's jokes that's from I you provide. george i think um lasagna jokes have been all the rage on the internet for for a little while so maybe this is this is your moment. Anyway, I'll give you time to think yeah, about that. Okay. We're going we're gonna to talk about uh, this book. Uh, as I said in the interview, the um, proposal of the book, reading the back cover and the kind of uh, the, the information we got about it uh, via email I initially, I was really intrigued. Cover, Alex. Huh? I hope you read more than the back cover. No, I, I certainly read all of it, all of the pages and the words contained therein. But um, anyway, I found the proposal very interesting because as I said in the introduction, I don't think we have really grappled with, or I don't I think we have found a good description, let alone an analysis of what the world of financialization has done to society entirely. I mean, there's elements to it. I mean, we can think of something we discussed in the Reading Club recently, which is uh, Foucault's Birth of Biopolitics, where he actually is relatively um, far-sighted, clairvoyant even, uh, about a world in which we're all um, entrepreneurs of the self. But Aris's argument is actually we've gone a stage beyond that. We're, we're past neoliberalism to something else um, and that this is promising. What did you think of that argument? I mean, yeah, I mean, to, just to, to start where where you started in, in the interview, I think, and kind of to echo the, I guess, how it's an interesting question, this idea, is it is it uh, Eluse's idea of cold intimacies or, or the idea here of, of speculative intimacies it's, i think it is i i found it probably a bit of a stretch to say that there is the whole kind of imaginative world created by by swiping that this this kind of this can be the the cornerstone of um of a new post neoliberal or like a, a new kind of stage of modernity or however you want to put it but i think there is definitely something in that that question how do you <clears throat> just even restricting it to intimacies how do you like characterize them is and because I, I did find Eluse's book on cold intimacy is very compelling. That kind of, I guess, the the the, um, the stripping out of of some of the emotional content of of intimacies. But I guess, yeah, the, the question here is, what is the what are the material um, conditions producing these intimacies, and have does that mean that we've moved to a to a new situation? I'm sympathetic, and I agree with what George is saying. Um, I think the aspiration is the right one to try and go beyond. Um, because the, you know, you're always, if you want to make the case that all of this kind of dating technology is a symptom of, uh, you know, kind of, um, a new phase of, uh, technological alienation and, uh, social breakdown and fragmentation and so on, you're kind of repulsed away from modernity. And then also at the same time forced to elevate, you know, like what, you know, kind of 1950s dating rituals that yeah. we only know from kind of you know american movies or something so you're <clears> forced into kind of yeah well I mean, indeed, they, they must know, have been forced to... successful to a certain extent given that we're all here whatever the dating rituals were in the past you, you you, well but that's the same point about the dating apps right i mean it's not as if you know i mean partly the reason people use them is because they're successful you know it is the way people meet so you know, I'm sympathetic. I mean, I'm sympathetic to the aspiration not to be forced into kind of nostalgia for an imagined past, 
which would, you know, was in its own way kind of alienated and socially difficult and so on. And at the same time, not to, you know, not to um, belittle people's efforts to kind of create connection, even if they do it in these highly kind of uh, controlled ways. I mean, I think there is a point about... Are you talking about the imagined past of imagined communities? Yes, the imagined past of imagined community. I am talking about that. That's a double imagination. But the um, yes, it's a very effective way of disabling a line of thought, George. But what I was going the other element of that is the um, you see, I lost my train of thought. I hope you're happy now. It's called having a conversation. I that mean, wasn't not just a conversation, just mono, not just monologuing three times in a row. Sometimes people may ask you questions, interject points. That wasn't to, a fucking question, to, to was it? Yeah. The argument that wasn't George, a fucking you should, question. You should teach the uh, the wokes this technique because it's probably even more effective than yes, saying yes. actually what are your pronouns or please stop clapping it's triggering me or whatever so anyway don't, the don't point ask being, me a question it's triggering oh, to me Jesus when i'm Christ. trying to make, make can i finish Go the on. point what i was going to say was so you know I, being trapped between these two kind of poles you know it's not where you want to be it's problematic um and so but i'm not so you know i'm sympathetic to the aspiration but i'm left kind of cold and unmoved by um aris's responses i I think Um, he goes a step further also in saying not just that there is no way to go back to the past right we have to kind of embrace the possibilities thrown up by this speculative world of speculation um but also that the world of speculation itself means that there is no going back and that it has created subjects who are willing to throw themselves speculatively into the future, right? And I think that's an interesting argument, not just that it's impossible to go back to the past, but that we don't want to anymore. Um, and which which would tally with a certain idea that there's we live in a world of uh, a completely post-traditional world. Um, it's evocative. And, and, and it's it I mean, evocative. And some of the political examples he gives, then I maybe are a way to give this idea flesh. And then maybe we can discuss those, um, what we think. It's evocative, that. but I don't, you know, I kind of, I would like to... I would like to know what it, to think I understand what it means, but I can't really, you know, I can't really grasp it. And I'm, you know, and I was the, the TikTok kind of resistance, you know, the pro BLM TikTok resistance that he talked about again, kind of left me underwhelmed. Yeah. So, I mean, I like I say, I'm kind of I'm sympathetic to the aspiration, but I'm not the moves he makes and the kind of the way that he tries to do it leaves me unconvinced. I think there is something though in you know what's the um what's the orientation to the future if you don't have a if you don't have a past which is based on grand narratives if you don't have this kind of view of history with a capital h you know it might be the end of history or something like that um yeah what what sort of does does this mean that you are more your your view of time is is i guess more quantitative in the sense of your like it's about speculation and risk and calculation rather than anything qualitative there i mean there could be something there could be something in in that i think but you know drawing out the implications is is another <clears throat> another kind of thing it's i guess it's quite quite like it kind of fits with a with a kind of certain postmodernist framing of, of mm. what what uh, what the future is so so about the po- political thing because this is, was a really intriguing argument uh i would i have understood populism often a lot of right populism especially as a desire as speaking for a certain desire for stability for return to the certainties of the post-war era etc even if they're coded in kind of uh, cultural or even racial terms right um and that i mean that's an argument for example that paulo gerbaldo makes who's made it on the podcast talking about his book um about uh his most recent book um and it's and 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 Aris's argument is exactly goes completely contrary to that. You know, he he makes an argument that populism, especially in its kind of anti political formulation, is speculative. It's actually saying let's rip up the present and, and throw ourselves speculatively into the future. He even gives the example of the Greek Ochi, the vote, the vote against uh, against the EU memorandum, where Greece kind of speculatively threw itself into the future. I, I thought it was an interesting interpretation of of uh, of populism. I guess it does tally a little bit with what we've written in terms of interpreting populism as a form of anti politics, um, and not just seeing populism as a desire for for uh, you know for security and stability. But I think that is the that is an, a, a genuine ambivalence within um, kind of right populist movements and uh, upsurges and so on. So yeah, like I mean, the, I don't know if they're purely speculative. Yeah. Is what I guess what I'm saying. 
yeah i think there's <clears throat> i guess you can stretch the idea of speculation quite quite far if it means anything uh, like not having a concrete plan for, for the future but then i guess kind of maybe by that by that definition conservatism was always sort of speculative um in you know in a weird way to turn this on its head because it was not saying here's here's what the future looks like here's how we should move towards it instead it's a, an attempt to you know to not to not do that so maybe it's anti-speculative i've kind of taught myself around in a circle maybe but um yeah i wasn't entirely sort of I, I don't know i'm it didn't really ring true entirely um around i guess the full variety of, of different sorts of populism um and maybe it's just a characteristic of all politics that there's you know without these these with these exhausted traditions from the 20th century still lumbering on there's not really a there's not really a sort of a, a straightforward like here is the here is the future project the future is um um elusive yeah. just as the, the past is mythical you could say so yeah no and, and i think the the idea is that you know I agree insofar as, you know, yeah, we should be embrace the storm of modernity, uh, embrace the things that it might throw up, throw ourselves a little bit into the future. But exactly what the argument is lacking is the precisely that we need a sort of, you know, planning faculty, right? We need to think long term um, and project into the future and not just kind of take these random leaps of faith. And I think the, the the case over the Greek referendum is a perfect example. And I think I brought this up in the interview, which is precisely that, yes, the no was a good start, but it was merely a no. And you need a sort of a yes, you need a, some sort of a plan. And that's where political leadership comes in and where series of, the series of leadership failed to do that. So, um, you know, ultimately, if you're just going to stay with that rejection, that moment of rejection, I don't see where you go with that. Like that is that is remaining within anti-politics. And I don't see how embracing the speculative attitude is um, in any way kind of progressive or, or radical. So one of the, the questions that I, I mean, that I wasn't sure that I understood fully what the, what the outcome of the discussion was, was instead of like the political dimension, I guess what I think Aris was talking about, the moral dimension of speculation. I mean, that this, that it kind of plays a moral clearing function or, or like within markets, it kind of balances investment risk and makes people open to uncertainty or kind of balances all these things. I mean, is this, was this what you took him to mean? Because I guess my, my initial response to, to that is that, or, or the first thing that came into my head at least was, yeah, there's a, isn't the more important dimension that of speculation in the financial sense that it doesn't, it doesn't intend to produce anything. Like it's not investment of capital in order to serve a productive function. It's precisely this like, you know, you're, you're playing the game of the market and it doesn't have yeah. any actual necessary relation to anything like material. It's just, you know, you want to make money, not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Yeah, but and, 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 the, and investment point, right? is taking on risk, whereas uh, speculation is just throwing yourself into uncertainty, which is which is different. At least risk. as the, uh, the bourgeois economists um, tell us. But yeah, but it's, I mean, so that would seem to me to have like not a very positive moral dimension of uh, to, with regard to speculation, but it's a bad thing, basically, would be my... <laughs> my uh, anti-speculative conclusion. Phil, any uh, last comments here before we wrap up? Well, in that case, uh, we will leave this here. Um, I'd be interested to hear what you thought of this. Um, I think it's a it's a book whose ambition is uh, commendable. So, you know, I would be interested to hear what you make of this and whether you uh, are willing to embrace speculation and a speculative community and whether you see any political future in that. Anyway, we'll be back with more as usual uh, next week. So uh, catch you later. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.